Well, welcome back to another great episode of Dream Up, where everyone has a story about how they achieved their dream, from celebrities and experts to average Joes and Janes. Today, we have an amazing guest, the legendary comedian, George Wallace. Woo-hoo! Ooh, yeah. It's going to be awesome. I love it. I love it. And he happens to be one of my closest friends of all time as well. So we're going to have some fun today. That's awesome. So I'm one of your co-hosts, Carl the Beast Kozlowski, because my co-host, Ron, thinks I eat like a beast when offered a free meal. And that, <laughs> illus- and that illustrious co-host is... Ron, the mirthful married man Pearson, and with us, joining us, we, we're missing uh, Antonio, I can get you in Delgado, but today filling in for him, he did a great job last time, is Todd Big Ticket Turner. Todd the, or Todd Turner from Tyler, Texas. From Tyler, Texas, with the Tyler, Texas accent. <laughs> this is true. This is true. So glad you're with us, man. Thanks for coming in today. And uh, I'm just so excited about today's show, honestly, because we've all dreamed up in our lives. Uh, like Carl, you, your background is pretty interesting. You come from Arkansas and uh, had had to overcome some things. Tell us about it real quick. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I'm, 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 as far as overcoming things. Um, I'll Stuttering, mention, would that be the first thing you had exactly, to overcome? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Hey, look, the president does it too. Um, so I- uh, You I'm actually reporter. stutter quite a bit. Okay, and I'm a reporter and a comedian as well, but what uh, we want to spotlight today is that I've overcome a really crazy disability. I had a sleep disorder that made me virtually narcoleptic for about 20 years, and I couldn't drive even in the car capital of the world, Los Angeles, when I lived there, but in the past And, year, and by the way, I can attest to that because I had to give you rides more often than I cared to, <laughs> or had to wait for you to be late because... Well, 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 the the bus, and then then I missed the train, and then <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's true, but, but I mean, you've really overcome that. Yeah, the past year, uh, through the help of my dad, a four, who's a retired doctor, um, he got me a lot of specialists when I moved back to the Little Rock area, and uh, they've managed to cure everything. So I drive, and my whole life is so much better now. Yeah. You honestly, you're crushing it now. I'm so proud of you, Carl. Way to go! But what? So what is it? How, how do you get over something like that? How did that well, happen? I mean, for me, it wasn't narcolepsy per se, which I don't know if it's curable. Jimmy Kimmel is the one other uh, comedian that's or comedy figure that's known to have narcolepsy. He takes a pill and he has it in his contract that he takes a nap every day. That's funny uh, but, because I've fallen asleep during his show all the time. <laughs> well, it's late at night but uh, yeah but uh, no for me it was really a combination of um that i had undiagnosed bipolar disorder so i was very manic and would stay up till crazy hours and then have to get up early for work so every day i was sleeping like maybe five six hours max and you do that to yourself for years on end your whole body's a wreck and also uh uh, I wasn't treating my diabetes properly and now have that under control. And, uh, you know, you get carb comas where you get tired or even pass out if your carbs are out of whack. So, um, you know, got those under control and uh, everything changed, you know. You know, Carl, it's really funny how you start with narcolepsy, but then throw in an entire kitchen and kitchen sink of other diagnoses. Yeah, if I had all those, I'd probably... I'd want to nap too if I had all those other issues. I just wouldn't want to think about it. <laughs> yeah, well, so I'm an inspiration on all levels. What I'm to be awesome. honest, you're living the best you that I've known you, and I've known you for a long time, and you're you. really crushing it now. And I, I'm just proud of you, man. Way to go. Thank you. Way yeah. You well, well, what's something you've overcome, Ron? Well, <laughs> I've had to overcome being the baby of eight kids. Somebody oh. needs attention, and he needs it now. So let's do a radio show, guys. <laughs> yeah. True that. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Seattle. I'm a, I am had to overcome being a college dropout. <laughs> I was actually on the dean's list studying business finance, but I worked really hard as a juggler. Of all things, sometimes we make bad life choices, and apparently <laughs> that one was my biggest. But it did well. I ended up being the fourth-ranked juggler in the world at the World Championships in 1985. I dropped out of school, became a street performer, and have worked my way up to a great career in Hollywood and, and uh, great investments, and life's been really good. It's amazing how much you can 
achieve uh, it's way beyond my wildest dreams ever i if i when i was a kid i i had visions in my head uh, i'll do this and i'll do this i hit, hit those by the time i was 29 and i i'm just really thankful now i've had some big losses in that time too and it's great to dig yourself back out of that hole which is a whole nother episode of, of show we need to talk about yeah sure but um but i feel really blessed and i feel like i've dreamed up my life todd what about you, Slick? You know, it's interesting. You know, I grew up in East Texas and I'm proud of it and also sort of feel like I grew out of it. It's, um, you know, it's easy to sort of stay in the mindset of where you are, you know, where you're born. And I probably could have just uh, stayed there and got a job and, and lived happily ever after. But East um, Texas isn't, there's not major, major cities in East Texas. No, it's, also, it's a lot of small towns and it has a mentality and it's very, uh, you know, I use the word incestuous lightly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's incestuous <laughs> thinking. It's sort of like, here's what a, a man looks like. Here's how you behave. Here's what you do. And I and I was blessed enough to get out of that where I now have traveled the world. I work with major nonprofits around the, the whole globe. And um, I've just got to see different cultures and, um, you know, different ways to look at life. And it's just been, it's been rewarding for me to sort of jump out of a small mentality into a bigger one. I feel very blessed that I've been able to do that. Not always off my own, uh, you know, um, planning. If I sort of lucked out, quite frankly, or was, I've been blessed for the opportunities. But I, I look back now and think I could have never gotten from there to here without the help of, uh, you know, hard work and somebody above. Well, I'm also going to add to that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hard work is one thing that all three of us have in common. And when we put our nose to the grindstone, it always, you know, I always tell my kids hard work pays off, may not in the short term, but eventually it will really kick in and you'll get some things from it. The other thing I'm going to mention that all three of us have done that I know of uh, is who you surround yourself with and yeah. putting yourself around other people, you know, who you know, and, and there's a lot to it, but people want to be around people that are going to be an asset to them and uh, going to add something to their world. And so when you end up being a giver, and, and serving others, I think it really helps um, helps lift you up. It's kind of it's kind of against the grain of what you would think. You know, it's not being selfish doesn't doesn't necessarily always help. But um, what do you well, think? I think that, you know, and it's also uh, a matter of um, if you surround yourself with bad people, you can be dragged down. And uh, the story for another time is that uh, I got ripped off of over $14,000 by a business partner that I thought was my best friend at the time. Uh, you know, and I'll, I'll pay you back, Carl. I'll pay you back. <laughs> Are you still <laughs> mad about that? <laughs> Actually, I've borrowed about $14,000. And by the way, it was only $13,899. Man, you round up. <laughs> I know, right? No, but I'm just saying, you know, that, that if you're not careful, you know, uh, uh, that was a friend that I, like 10, 15 years ago, I was, you know, a totally different kind of place in my uh, life. And I thought, oh, I want to be around this guy who's kind of like, you know, sort of an edgy kind of a person. And uh, yeah, I wound up getting cut by by the edge versus uh, looking for somebody who's just a good, solid person, you know? Yeah. Well, life's about bouncing back and you bounced back real well, Carl. Way to go. So uh, what do you say we head to the news, boys? Yeah. All right. So every week we take a look at some of the week's stories that tie in with Dreaming Big. So, and now the news. So last week we talked about Elon Musk's launch of the SpaceX rocket with the first all civilian non-astronaut team ever to fly in space. That seemed to go well, or did it? And an <laughs> alarm went off on SpaceX's all tourist space flight. The problem was that the toilet suctioning fans, which are key to keeping poop and pee in the space toilet, rather than floating through the cabin area, went out at one point and the crew needed to help to get to fix it from the ground, but then lost communication for 10% of their flying time. They claim nothing disastrous happened, but the article points out all sorts of gross facts that I think would keep our nation's five to seven year olds fascinated in science class. What do you think about all this guys? Oh man, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Yeah, the shit problem. literally hit the fan. <laughs> Apparently, there's a fan system, and I guess oh, yeah. the shtick literally hit the fan. Oh my god! Oh man, Houston's like Houston. We have a problem. What's the problem? Well, 
Carl and Todd just ate a week's supply of chili con carne, and my eyes are watering so much I can't read the control panel. Get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> they could also be like, is your problem number one or number two? Uh, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. I, I actually feel sorry for these guys. You know, they they spend all this money to, they have to live a childhood dream. And they, they even think about the press conference when they come down and they want to talk about their giant feet and they spend the whole time talking about, you know, their bowel movements. They're like, hey, guys, I just ordered the earth. And they're like, hey, tell me which way the toilet flushes in space. We want to know. <laughs> yeah, and well, Australia goes the other way around. What does it do up there? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they paid $200 million each to go to space only to find that the toilet wasn't working. I mean, come on. You know, it's oh ridiculous. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Hey, you know what? I wouldn't spend four days with you guys in a Winnebago. And in a way, <laughs> Winnebago, at least you can open the windows. Up there, they're like, oh, no. We're stuck. We're stuck. <laughs> We're stuck. Smell stays in oxygen, and I can't let the oxygen out of this capsule. <laughs> That's so funny. It's, it is funny. It's sort of, you know, billionaire problems, right? I mean... You know, they always say everything rolls downhill, but the uh, richer you are, the higher you get to go, right? So these guys are just keeping going up the hill, and uh, they still got to go to the bathroom up there, right? That's right. Yeah, well, there's the old children's book, Everybody Poops, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 here's a crazy thing. The, the, the article that I found this in, which was by CNN, found that they, they, went, they actually dug up uh, problems from other bathroom issues throughout NASA space history. And they said that in, on the 1969 Apollo 10 mission, uh, one astronaut reported back to mission control that a piece of waste was floating through the cabin. And it was according to once confidential government documents, the transcription of this high classified information said, give me a napkin quick. Here's another <laughs> GD turd. Oh, Apparently wow. it was Todd's, and that's how he got the name Big Ticket. Big Ticket Todd. <laughs> I left my ticket stud floating in space. <laughs> and you want to know how the, the original space toilet worked? What it was was they would tape plastic bags to their butts. Is that, that true? Space, yes. That was the original space toilet on all the missions to the moon. So Neil Armstrong and all those guys... They were even more heroic than we ever imagined. <laughs> you know, what's funny is, you know, we're talking about dreaming up, you know, getting people to space is really like the ultimate dream up concept in the world. Yeah. And you still see there's problems with everything. And I think it's how to overcome them, how to overcome them. I'm curious to see how they solved it up there because they're all obviously people who, I mean, you can get rich and forget how you got there and just stop being a problem solver. But most people that do really, really well are probably problem solvers. And I hope they are because I can't get a plumber to come to my house for nothing. I can't imagine being 300 miles up in space. Who's going to show up there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, you're on to something, Ron. It's very interesting. You know, it reminds you of the humanity of it all. I mean, I'm sure we all thought getting to space, the rockets were the hardest part. But quite frankly, the body works off gravity. And so it's very complicated. Carl, as you mentioned, this has been a problem from the beginning is yeah. your, your waist doesn't know how to exit your body. And they, have, they, have, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars to try to figure this stuff out. It's a yeah. very complex issue and they just don't like talking about it. Well, here's one other thing that, that, that uh, part of it, they say that up to 80% of astronauts get uh, violently nauseously sick uh, but the, most of them they have a ways of keeping them from actually throwing up but one guy who was on multiple missions he flew on four space shuttle missions said that he uh, threw up over 100 times on the four flights can you imagine you're throwing up and it's floating through the cabin and it's yak nothing yak, do don't it. talk back <laughs> <laughs> Wow. You know what? I, I, uh, in a true dream up fashion, you should figure out how to solve a problem and monetize it, right? Okay. Make something great out of it. So I say NASA or SpaceX start selling sponsorships, and I think they should to Depends. <laughs> Not bad. I've already bought the domain astropoop.org, so I'm already working on it, Ron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Well, we should uh, hit one other story. We're gonna we're gonna have to drop a couple, but um, 
I, uh, let's see. I guess I want to spotlight uh, the story about um, the uh, Conjuring House, Electric News 2, or lead story 2, Electric Boogaloo, is our story about how the story, movie, uh, the Conjuring horror movies, there's three of them. They made over half a billion dollars at the world box office. And they're based on the real life stories of haunted houses. And uh, the real life house from the first movie that was filled with demons that had to be kicked out by exorcists is now up for sale for $1.2 million. Ron, you'd like to invest in real estate. Would you go for this one or is that a bad move? I I love real estate and I'm an Audi on this one. <laughs> <laughs> they 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 filmed the movie there, okay? Is that correct? Yes. And they brought in a real life exorcist because problems okay. were happening. The I don't know if the movie was actually filmed there. The movie's based on a true story. The house was so haunted it was legendary and uh, there was uh, there's a married couple of Catholics who are exorcists that aren't priests. And they cleaned the house out of demons. And it was such a horrifying story that it became the basis of this worldwide smash hit horror movie. And now that house that was haunted in the real life story is up for sale for $1.2 million. Yeah, yeah. See, this is this is crazy. When I buy a house, I just want to make sure it has a stable foundation and the HOA deeds are, are friendly. I don't need to know if the master closet takes me to the seventh layer of hell. Like, I'm not going into this house. I'm not buying this. Um, um, if they had problems with the toilet out in space. Imagine the toilet in this house. <laughs> <laughs> it flushes up for sure. The toilet is probably the portal to hell. Yeah, I'd be you able know, to sit down in there. You know what's interesting, though, is there is someone, I mean, when, when we strip off all the jokes and whatnot yeah. and, and look at the story for what it is, people are now trying to capitalize on it and use it as their ticket ticket to to uh, a, a higher thing they're serving yeah. a community there's certain types of people i guess who want to experience otherworldly things why you would want to try and experience something along these lines i it it escapes me but um it's interesting that people put a tremendous value on that because uh, you'd think that it would be selling for about Eighty nine thousand, not one point two million. Well, that's what they're yeah, that's what they're asking. Doesn't mean that's what they're getting. But you're a hundred percent right, Ron. You know to walk away from a deal when your home inspector is a Roman Catholic priest. <laughs> <laughs> At least they'll you know, be I, honest. Apparently, <laughs> I, I, I actually have experience in this regard uh, because I lived in what is believed to be a haunted building in Los Angeles, the Gaylord Apartments. And I had a friend who claimed that she could detect uh, spirits. Um, and and she, was, she was like a Christian Catholic woman, but she had this sort of sense for things, she said. And she, she told me I had to get it blessed. And I'm friends with a couple of priests. I had my apartment blessed probably every two years, the whole 10 years I lived there, because, I, because it was just was such a weird feeling sometimes living around that. Yes. And, uh, so, and, and, yeah. and I went in and looked in your apartment and it looked like something had uh, poltergeisted <laughs> around. And I just think it's your cleanliness habits, Carl. <laughs> yeah. 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 You didn't need a priest. You needed a maid, Carl. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully somebody will be able to dream that up. But man, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. What do you say we go on to getting our, uh, our lead guest, the, my uh, good friend for over 30 years, George Wallace on, on right. uh, what do you say, let's, guys? Let's do it. All right, so Ron, tell us about our guest. Well, I have to say, I've known this guy for over, actually 30 years this year, he's been my friend. No, 33 years this year. My goodness, he, you've seen him on The Tonight Show, The Late Show his own comedy specials, movies. He was Mr. Las Vegas. He's a comedy legend, ladies and gentlemen. My friend, Mr. George Wallace. Yay! Yeah. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. So good to talk to you guys today. 30 years is too long to have as a friend. I should drop you tomorrow. That's way too long. <laughs> You're in your New York City house. Is yes, that right? I am. Yes, I am. You are. Uh, atop looking over Central Park. Exactly. That's actually my view. That's a reverse view, but that's what I'm looking at. That's what I am right now. Wow. Yeah. 
So you poor it, thing, George. You poor mm -hmm. thing. It all built on jokes, man. It all built exactly. It's uh, all uh, I believe. But what is it? A uh, crazy world. It, uh, well, tell thinking, some of the crazy world. Why is the world crazy, Henry? Well, it's just everything is crazy. Look at the news. Look what's going on today. Excuse me. I just ordered a pizza. I don't know what's going on with pizza these days. They got they, all over television. Pizza seven ninety nine, right? Yes. How the hell by the time it gets to your house is twenty six eighty three? What do they do? <laughs> What do they do? I don't know. I've tried it over and over again. Seven ninety nine for the pizza. By the time they get to your house, they got a delivery fee. They got a, a, a convenience fee. Convenience to who? To whom? It's just <laughs> it's crazy. How about when you what, open it up? What's that little white thing in the middle? That little white table. Who is that little white table for? Yeah, right. Who eats on that little table? The roast. She said something about the pizza. <laughs> it's driving me crazy. Everything is crazy. Toilet paper. You know. You know, it's, what is it? Double roll, twice the rolls, double the money, and you're using twice as much. I buy just as much toilet paper now than I ever did before. I'm using twice as much. They got something going on with this money, but this, with these numbers, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Well, we're so glad you're with us today, George. Um, you know, you what a what a comedy history you've had, and and uh, let's just take people all the way back to where you grew up. You grew up in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. Your dad was was a butcher. Yep, he was a butcher. He just cut us up if we got in trouble. He cut us up. That's why <laughs> he was known as the butcher. Yeah, so so life is good coming all the way from Georgia back in the... Uh, uh, was the he? Early... Was your dad funny? Totally, totally funny. He would, uh, like when I turned 16, he'd do stupid stuff like, I'd say, Dad, can I borrow the car? He'd just go, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we knew that was we knew that, that, was, no. a, that was a that was a no you just go mm -hmm, sure you can borrow the car but you can dad can i have a car yeah <laughs> were you a good kid or were you get in trouble are you kidding my dad is uh, deacon george was i'm out of the church never get into trouble if you get into trouble my dad only spanked me three times in life and one time i was we were down south so we had an underneath the house i was playing with fire underneath the house and with I fire could, yeah, I was playing. I could have got, you know, I could have set the house on fire. Crazy. Uh, you but, never uh, told me this story. Well, you, well, my, I never, you never asked me about my dad. My, one well, time my dad know. whooped me. One time my dad slapped me upside the head because he said something. And I thought he had walked away. I said, there's only two bullets in the world. I'm one and I'm looking for the other one. And I didn't know he was standing right behind him. Oh. <laughs> he said, uh-huh. <laughs> he said, mm -hmm. <laughs> Hey, George, yeah, Mr. Well, George Wallace, what a, what a great man and a great disciplinarian. And I love that guy. And I was the tight kid was when my dad car would pull up in the driveway, I would hit the door just before he got when he got out of the car, I was at the door. I said, much I love my dad. Because you know the sound of your dad's car. You know that sound once it hits the driveway. Yeah. Your dad's home, boom, I'd hit the door because he would go to work and sometimes he wouldn't he wouldn't eat all his lunch and he would bring it back. And I wouldn't finish eating his lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. What was your uh, what was your first job? I mean, it's hard to, to be an apprentice at a butcher shop. Nobody wants to give a, a kid a knife, right? I mean, did oh, you work with no. him? I wasn't a butcher. My dad was a butcher at Swift and Company. You know, the, the Swift butterball turkey and the meat. The, the professional butcher, not just a store. Uh, he cut up to me from the hog. What did they call it? The house? The slaughterhouse. Yeah. Slaughterhouse. Yeah, oh. the window. You go out there and it smelled terrible and woo. <laughs> and cows and pigs and everything. They cut it up, slice it up, send it to the market. And we had, I never grew up without meat. We mm. had steak for breakfast so much that we went, Mom, Mom, would you please stop? We had every steak from the, the round steak, butt steak, cube steak. The foremost of steak was tough as hell. You had to beat the hell out of it. You know, they would beat it. A cube steak, right? It looked like a hamburger. And they'd beat it. <laughs> and um, but I grew up with meat all my life and just freezer full of meat. And we would uh, the only uh, house in America where the kids are going, please, vegetables, please. Uh, <laughs> oh, we had the vegetables. We had the vegetables. My mom was a cook. It was a real two family house, mom, dad, and just totally uh, uh, respect for the community and the greatest family ever, actually. Well, that we, we, we that also good. prepared you for Vegas a lot because. Uh, you know, the, uh, everywhere there, it's like steak and eggs for breakfast. So you were ready. So yeah, I was ready for that. You know, that's all I eat in Las Vegas is eggs. You know, you eat eggs before you go to bed. You eat eggs when you wake up. It's an egg town. And eggs, I've become a, a friend of eggs. You know, eggs is the number one industry in the world. Really? Of, uh, see, most people, if I were to ask you what's the number one industry in the world, you might go, 
Oreo, or you might even go to the auto industry, wouldn't you? Yep. It's actually eggs. You think wow. about it. I was talking to the chicken man yesterday, and the chicken man told me <laughs> that if the egg- if It's the an chicken actual would, chicken man? That's, that's, he said, come on. <laughs> he actually said to me, if chick, you just think about this. I know I make up a lot of stuff because I lie. I love to lie. I, I got the greatest job in the world. But the chicken man did tell me that if you just think if the chickens were to stop laying eggs, what would happen to this world? It would wreck the economy. There'd be no grand slam at Denny's. Come on. Mm-hmm. You, go to, you go to a Chinese restaurant, just order Fuyong Fuyong <laughs> soup. You, let's look in the chicken. You know, just think about chicken. There'd be no birthday cakes, you know? <laughs> Yeah. If, you, if you don't have the birthday cakes, you don't need the candles. That go to the wax business and the candles. And if you don't have the candles, huh, who needs matches? You see what I'm saying? For the Take birthday economics. Cake. Let alone that little box that the matches go in. Now, let me tell you something about eggs. Now, if there's no eggs, there'd be no Easter. Now you're messing with the preacher at the church. You oh know, that's the clothing industry. Nobody's buying clothing, you know, and the preacher can't buy a brand new car. So now you're messing with the auto industry. Eggs are that important. It's if we, we wouldn't even have beaches if there were not eggs. And you well, love was, chicken. You love chicken too, George. Yeah, but I'm telling you, you be, uh, let me tell you about this, this. The beaches would be, the sand would be backed up if because, you know, if we didn't have those hourglasses with the sand in it. Yes. Just think how many of those we have. If we didn't have those hourglasses <laughs> and sandbags, beaches would be backed up with sand forever. So, you know, so and that, you need the egg timer, you know, with the egg timer. When you yes. <laughs> So you just need eggs. We wouldn't even, sometimes I push it a little bit. We, we wouldn't even have egg plants. You're, you're using, you're using really it. old egg timers here. It's, I see a problem right now with your egg timer. Like they have electronic ones now, George. Do electronic ones? Oh, oh yeah. So they can just see it come down. See, I'm very old. So I'm, I'm really old. Okay. So. <laughs> I am so old. I remember when people called you on the phone, you didn't know who it was. <laughs> Good old days. Yeah, now you know everybody. You look at your phone, you go, oh. I started out to pick up on you guys' call. Because <laughs> <laughs> I changed my name to Car Warranty. <laughs> Before we get off the phone, somebody's going to call me, it's going to say potential spam. How can we, you know, now I've gotten to the point where I like to talk to them. Yeah, I like to talk to them. The warranty program, I said, oh, yeah, give me that. What else can I get? Add on everything you can, add on. And my uh-huh. wife has a car too. My wife has a car. My kids has a car. Give me three times the program. They say, you want three times? Yeah. I'm very rich. I'm very rich. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's time for the credit card. That's when you back off. Everything. It, it, a guy, did you ever get the call where somebody, uh, somebody called me from Jamaica. They told me I had won $250,000. I was a lucky winner. I said, are you kidding me? And they said, yeah, you're the lucky winner, $250,000. I said, I have never won anything in my life. They said, well, you won today, Mr. Wallace. You know, and I said, what do I have to do? I'm, I'm so, are you sure? Yes, you Wallace, and this is your number. What do I have to do to get this money? All you have to do is send in a $250 uh, acceptance fee. You just go down, you go down to uh, the Western Union or someplace like that, and, and you send it to this address, and uh, then we'll forward the, the money to you. The truck is on the way. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do that right now. So I would just sit there and do whatever I had to do. And for an hour later, they called back and said, uh, we were still waiting for the money. Did you go to the drugstore? I said, oh, my God, I forgot. I forgot. I'll go now. I'll go now. They called back an hour later. <laughs> they called back an hour later. They said, Mr. Wallace, we're still waiting for the $250. You just take it and send it to this account. I said, you know what? I said, first of all, you, you said I won $250,000. You said the truck was on my way to the house, right? Yes, it's on the way, but we need the initial fee. I said, well, if the truck is on my way, is, is on the way to my house, what is my address? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have address. I said, you got to give me $250,000 and you don't really have my address. He said, well, the truck driver has an address. I said, well, when he get here, that's when I'll send you the $250. <laughs> <laughs> and then that next was- thing you know, we were cursing each other and, and you some of them or you sell you this and that. Oh man, it was back, but it was fun. So I love to play with them. So that's great. That's good for you. So you're now we're going to go back. Your first job. Did you have a job in Atlanta before you went to college up in Akron? 
Of course, I cut grass. I, I was a newspaper boy. I was the number one newspaper boy in Atlanta, Georgia. I was on the corner of a How many school. newspaper boys were there? There was just you? Yeah, oh, I was no. number one. <laughs> no, no. Back in the day, we sold newspapers. Everybody in the city. Uh, Did you uh, deliver to homes or you stood on the corner and sold? I stood on the corner. Five-star journal, get your five-star journal. Atlanta journal, five-star journal, get your paper, get your paper. Evening edition, five-star journal. And I would give them to the car. People driving their cars standing in the middle of the street. The newspaper was five cents. Uh, and the newspaper would get three cents and I get two cents. Are you oh, serious? I love it. Did, yeah, did, I've got to know, did, was there any big story events that you rushed that day of like any major thing where you sort of read the, the front page news? Special issue. Wallace, you guys get ready. Coming to pick you up right now. John F. Kennedy dead. Got a newspaper, Sunday newspaper. Wow. Sunday news, special Sunday newspaper on Saturday. Went down and sold that newspaper and people giving us a dollar for the newspaper. And, you know, during the day when I was working, we were, this was after school. Uh, we were making, coming home with maybe $2 or $3 a day. That's all we were making, $2. That's but a you lot could, of money. But you could go to McDonald's and get a hamburger and a fries and, um, and a soda for 79 cents total. Yeah. 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 Total. Wow. So the three dollars was a lot of money, believe it or not. And we saved up enough money to get those Converse uh, sneakers, you know, and uh, whatever you needed for school. So that was a lot of money back in the day. And so how never... old were you when you started selling papers? Two. No. <laughs> <laughs> no I, was I about, said selling I was them, in, not wetting them. I was in. I, was in, <laughs> <laughs> I, was in, I probably was in uh, thirteen or fourteen back in the day. You just had a work ethics. You knew you wanted to work. Hey, listen, we used to make money by picking up soda bottles uh, if we needed money in, in Atlanta. You go around, I don't know how this happened in Atlanta. If you were to buy a soda, uh, it was only five cents. But if you took the, the bottle back, you get two cents on the bottle. I don't know how they made money back in the day. I don't know how they made money. One nickel for the Coca-Cola, take the bottle back, they give you two pennies. So if you were a kid and you needed something, you just go all over the neighborhood looking for bottles. And you could get yourself like a 50 cents or, or uh, and 50 cents was a lot of money. That could, because back when I was a kid, you could buy two for a penny cookies out of the jar. They would sell them separately, you know, two for, yeah, you'd even, yeah. you could even, you could even buy, sing, men bought single cigarettes back in the day. Mm. Uh, single remember, cigarettes? Yeah, I remember a pack of cigarettes, a pack of Camel cigarettes, Chesterfield, 25 cents, 26 cents. Yeah, we had every, I'm old, man. I remember a loaf of bread for 16 cents. Wow. You are old. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was old, even when I was in college, gas was 29 cents a gallon. Wow. Wow. So what made you decide to pick University of Akron and go up there? Because my parents travel a lot and I love travel. And uh, uh, University of Akron was one of the only schools that had a degree in transportation. You had the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I, I didn't even know where that was. My sure as hell didn't want to go. But I had family in Akron, Ohio. And uh, so I went there and just study. And before I studied, I uh, started working at Firestone Time Rubber Company. And I uh, worked there and I was making a dollar 47 cents an hour, young people. You were doing that while you were in school. I hadn't even you started were a double school. major. You were a double major, though. No, I hadn't even started school yet. I just knew oh, I wanted to degree in transportation. You moved up there before school started. Yeah, I moved to Akron, Ohio at 17 years old because my mom had just died and I went to live with my sister, plus the university. And, but before school started, I was working at Firestone Time Rubber uh, at uh, uh, $1.47 cents an hour. And then it came around September when it's time to go to school, Firestone had a tuition reimbursement program. So they paid for school if you passed the grades, if you passed. That's so fantastic. That, that was a blessing to do that. And plus, uh, I did that I went to school for uh, only one quarter. I said, I want to live in the dorms. And I became an RA after living RA. in the dorms one, one quarter. You know, you're supposed to be a junior before you get that. But I got away with just, I, I'm, I'm so blessed. I, I started talking to the people. They said, well, we think you can do it. I said, wow, that's awesome. Awesome. personality plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what did you know what you wanted to do in college or did it take you a couple of years to figure out what, what where you were aiming with your major or did you come in knowing right away? Well, I knew right away because like I said before earlier, my parents traveled a lot and I always loved traveling. I would love it even on the bus, on the Greyhound bus. Initially, I wanted to be an announcer at the bus station. The Sun Chief Express by Greyhounds, by Greyhounds is now boarding at Zone B, Track 2. Zone B, Gate 2. <laughs> all aboard. Chicago, Cincinnati, Akron, Cleveland, all aboard. The Greyhound Express. 
And I would go to the train station. I would hear them in the train station like, Penn Station, that's really good. That's, the <laughs> Northwest Express on Penn Station is now boarding on track 14. Track 14 Express, your gate is open, now ready for departure. All aboard. I used to love to do that. I wanted to do that. So, so transportation, I, I love transportation. I said, oh, let me get a degree in transportation. And a lot of people don't know this. I was kidding earlier about eggs being the number one industry, but actually the number one industry in the world is transportation. People fail to realize that. Sometimes I talk about it on stage and say, anybody know what transportation is? I have a degree in transportation. They say, uh, are you a bus driver? And I said, you get up and get the hell out of here, right? Now. Get up and get the hell out of here. <laughs> But transportation is the number one. I'm gonna school you guys a little bit right now. People fail to realize that the shirt on your back had to get to you through some form of transportation. The microphone you're talking on, the chair you're sitting in, look around, everything you see, everything you see had to get to you through some form of transportation. And there are five modes of transportation. You got air, pipeline. Let us board, guess, let us ship. guess. Yeah, go ahead. Too late, air. <laughs> I, I got, okay, give me number five is pretty tough. Go, let me see what you got. Train, boat. That's rail, boat. There you go. Um, you said pipeline. Yeah, that most people don't get that's pipeline. hard. That one's a hard one. Well, uh, well, you got Elon that Musk just, tunneling. <laughs> what, what else did you say, Carl? No, oh, I was saying Top Gun pipeline because George already said it. You cheated. I said I Elon Musk tunneling. That's the new one. Okay. Oh, okay. We're talking about goods. It can't be like a telephone wire. It's not wires because we're no, talking no, no, about no. things, not but, data. But it, it is, you're missing number one, and that's trucking. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 So, 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 it's, so it's, a, <laughs> it's a pretty big industry. As you look around, as you notice, uh, uh, there's more shipping, there's more transportation on ships than any form of transportation. People don't know that. Because uh, yeah, I guess a lot of people don't see ships. They don't know. Everything pretty much come off a ship coming from wherever. Uh, but the trucking, it's, it's amazing. Transportation is amazing. And now- you know What's amazing to me is you, uh, most people see George, he's the funny guy, he's this, he's that. Listen to all the wealth of knowledge you're giving us. You, you're kind of a lifelong learner. I know Todd, you talk about this a lot. Lifelong learners. You're always learning, you're always growing. You're always setting new goals. Um, so when you got out of college, what was it you wanted to do and be? I always wanted to be before I did anything, before I worked as a newspaper boy, before I worked at Firestone Town River, before I became an RA, before I received any degree, I wanted to be a comedian at six years old. Wow. Mm. So I always knew what I wanted to be at six years old. I know what I was working toward, my goal. And, and, but that uh, wasn't the path you took because you got out of school and the first thing you did was sell rags. Well, I got out of school and I moved to New York City because Firestone and Tyler River Company wanted to offer me a job, uh, a permanent job at $800 a month. And I said, no, oh, no, nah, give me eight sixty. And they said, no, sir, you got a college degree and make it $800 a month. And that was really good back in the day. Yeah. And then, now I said, I need eight sixty. That was only $15 per week more, right? Right. Yeah. Come on. They wouldn't give it to me. I said, okay, if I go to New York City, here I come. That's a blessing that they didn't give it to me. Mm -hmm. You think, had I stayed, had they given me that day, I could have still been at Firestone Town Rubber Company uh, supervising the computer room, the uh, data, and making uh, good uh, Ohio money. <laughs> That's what <it's> <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I came to New York City to uh, achieve my goal and I come up here. Now, I needed to work. I always knew I needed a financial cushion. So some the people, old people, say something to fall back on. And uh, I was reading the New York uh, Times. Uh, some of you guys are too young to know this, but back in the day when you needed a job, you would read the full newspaper and you go to the one ads and it would say uh, sales would always be the top money and advertising sales. And I was looking through that and I saw one sales job that said 75 to $300 a day. And I didn't know what it was. I said, what wow. the hell is this? You know, 75 to $300 a day. So I went to apply for it and it was selling rags at a company in Cleveland, Ohio, called Cleveland Cotton Products. Cleveland Cotton Products, which took me back from New York City, right back to Akron, Cleveland, Ohio, to learn about rags. And when I say rags, people would be surprised how many people need rags and what a rag salesman makes. 
You've now, gone from rags to riches, that's for yeah. sure. Now, Todd, now Todd, you probably remember the rag guy would come with a, you seen a mechanic walk out of the, the, the uh, service station of the garage with an old rag, a, a torn shirt or anything like that. And they yep. used to have a dipstick, Ron, you're not old enough to mm -hmm. remember that, but they would ch always check your oil. Yep. And they would take that and wipe that with a rag, any rag. But that rag cost money. They had to buy a bell of rags. And I, and I, um, Cleveland Cotton Products sold disposable rags. Aren't all 19, rags disposable, George? <laughs> 1972. All rags are disposable, but no, you can't dispose of a piece of uh, a garment. You can't uh, a piece of a real rag. But a disposable cloth, I sold in 1972 a cloth you now know as Chevron. Oh, wow. wow. Back in the day, we didn't have a title for it. It was called the Chevron. Wow. I mean, it was called just a, a piece of cloth. I think it was 4206 that we had a number for. It. And I went to Earl Shive and I says, here's a cloth that's um, same size, every, a uniform cloth, always the same size. It's a, you can reuse it, you can wash it, and um, it's reusable. And, and I can sell it to you for, first of all, I had to take any rag. I found the biggest rag I could find. And I had to weigh it. How much are you paying per pound for rags? And it was a 23 cents per pound. And I had a, a pin scale like this, like this pin I'm yeah. holding here, but it was a scale. I put the rag on there and weighed a rag. I said, oh, that's an eight ounce rag. That is costing you 12 cents per, uh, per rag. You pay 24 cents per pound. Yeah. And at the same time, I'm doing fractions in my head of what I could sell him this uniform cut cloth. What I want to sell this guy at. I can sell you this cloth. If he's already paying 12 cents per pound, I just uh, I can sell you a brand new cloth that's reusable for 10 cents each. Why wouldn't you buy that? It's oh, what a sales pitch. That's, that's a sales pitch. And I'll buy some now. They said, <laughs> I don't yeah. even need them. And I went to Earl Shad one day. They needed rags. I made $3,500 on one day. Wow. Wow. So, so mm -hmm. if you're doing the, 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 you were doing that well with the sales and you were in the right city or, or you were back in Ohio. So how did you wind up? Did you start doing comedy in Ohio or did you uh, eventually make enough money that you just decided, hey, time to make the jump and go back to New York for comedy? Or, or how, did that, how did that transition happen? I actually went back to Ohio to Cleveland Con Product just to yeah. study rags, learn about the rags, the, the different products they had. We had also had, back in the day when you, uh, I'm talking to Todd a lot because he's a little older than you guys. The dental oh. cloth used to be- uh, um, Not than me. No, uh, you remember the dental cloth used to be a napkin? Uh, oh yeah, the blue napkin. Yeah. But then we put uh, we took a handy white and put a plastic coating on it. And so that napkin cost an dentist 25 cents per per um, client. What do you what do you call it for his patient? Patient. Yeah, we give I sell him that cloth or whatever I wanted to sell him. Here's 15 cents for a disposable cloth. You throw it away. You don't have to worry about sending it up, but them picking it up. So we sold that. We sold the, the sponges. I sold a sponge about this size. You put water on it, it would expound just like that. It would absorb the water and expound. So we sold all kinds of rags. We sold a, a Balbriggan t-shirt. It was a t-shirt like I'm wearing. That was, you could polish the cars with it. We also sold a cloth like the outside of a, a feminine napkin, like Kotex, the product Kotex. Yep. That's a soft, very soft cotton. We said uh, 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 the pen liner of cotton. We use that also for waxing and polishing cars. Also, we use it for uh, that sheet of, uh, of, of thin paper for funeral homes, embalming the bodies, building up the body inside inside the clothing. So, so you really had a career going, a full career, yeah. and then you shifted. And Carl asked that before. How did you shift out of rags to when you started working for the uh, uh, the company? Why do you New guys let me sit here with this tag coming out of my head and you don't say anything? <laughs> I just, I was, uh, we thought it was a long setup for a joke. <laughs> With the price tag, me not still on it. I stole it. You see what I'm saying? No. So I made. A, I was. I was selling rags, and I was with a friend of mine in Ammonia Square in Athens, Greece, and we were talking about careers and making money. And I needed to make more than that first year out of college. I only made sixteen thousand dollars, but that was within eight That's months. A lot then. But it was, and it's only eight months also. So I was already traveling on holiday. I was with a friend in Athens, Greece, at Ammonia Square. We were talking about careers. 
And he was telling me about a friend that worked at Metro Media in New York, because I was already selling rags to the buses, to clean the buses in New York City. So I says, you know what? These things came together, the buses and the rags. I said, when I go back to New York, he said he had a friend making $34,000. I said, I'm going to make $34,000 as soon as I get back. And I went to Metro Media. There was a guy named John Kluge. John Kluge was the second richest man in America. He owned a, country, a company called Metro Media. Some of you might remember Metro Media. They owned uh, Fox 5 before he got out of the business. Fox 5. Everything up there on Sunset Boulevard and, uh, and, uh, and Los Angeles. The yeah. Fox, Fox, all of the Fox stations. And he sold that to... I guess Myrna, uh, and before he died. And, uh, but uh, I went to that company and said, I'm doing cold sales anyway. He's knocking on people's door, trying to sell them rags, mechanics, and funeral homes. And so now I want to sell advertising. And, and for about three months, I made nothing. I was, I was 15 cents per dollar. What do you call that commission? That's huge. 15. That's a good commission. Not if you ain't selling. Not, not a 15% of zero is still zero. <laughs> it's still zero. Tell it, well, okay, so did it go through your mind at one point? Like, man, I got to go back to rags. I, I, this isn't going to work. Or did you just... Oh, I never thought work? about anything. I never think about going back on anything I wanted to. I just knew I was going to do it. So, But yeah. I didn't know at the time when you're selling advertising, you can't go to a guy and say, and I'm selling, when I say advertising right now, I'm selling space on the buses, all the 5,000 buses in New York City. You can't make a sale in a month. You can't make a sale in two months. You gotta come, you gotta, you know, and I'm selling locally, not nationally yet. So I'm walking and knocking on people's doors, auto dealerships, trying to, I wanna put your business on the, on the streets. So not only did you have to sell the space, but you had to come up with a creative measure, but to, to get the copy, to have the signs made on the buses and then have them return uh, to the, bus terminal so they could put on the, the, the garage so we had a guy to put the signs on the buses. So you got a lot of sell and in three months nothing came in and they called me about five months and said, boy, it's getting pretty tough. We don't know how long we can stick with this. And uh, I said, well, uh, this, we'll work okay, with this. They were questioning we'll you, your ability. Well, anybody's ability. First of all, they never had a local salesman in New York City. Everybody was national. So they had me out in the borough of Queens in Brooklyn. It had oh, never been done before. Yeah, never been done before. So I went to Queens, Kings Plaza in Brooklyn once. I my one of my first big sales. They bought a program for a hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money back then. Well, that's, that's a lot 15, of money now. That, that's, that's fifteen thousand for me. Okay. Woo. So when that came through, I said, okay, that's that's they. But that was nothing for them. They were making big money. These Jewish yeah. guys. These Jewish guys. They were making big money and they taught me a lot. That was their, that's their business at the time, you know, and still yeah. is. Um, so, uh, uh, and I said, I did use the word Jewish because they own everything in that business and they, some some cases still do. And But they taught me a lot. They taught me a lot. And uh, I got that sales at $100,000 and another sale, $30,000, another sale, $15,000. Locally, we put ads inside the buses or then outside the buses. And I had one guy with a big attitude in, Brook in Queens. He owned a Lincoln Mercury dealership. He wanted to be at Times Square. So we owned the signs at Times Square. So I put him down at Times Square. Our local dealer, people said, why would he do that? I said, well, he gets that national attention when then people go, who's burning beard off, you know? He was on TV and he bought a hundred dollar program. And all those work, that work and I've been done for those first three months and four months, people were starting to call in, okay, we're going to try this. Okay, we're going to try this. We're going to try this. We'll try $30,000 program. We'll try $15,000 a month. We'll try uh, the Lincoln dealer, another Lincoln, another Cadillac dealership, the grocery stores. Things start to happen. The, uh, the psychics, you know the psychics? <laughs> yes. They would call and they wanted to be on the bus. Pretty soon, 15% was adding up. I get a call on my desk and said, George, Gene would like to talk to you. Because I was making money. Thinking, I, was, uh -oh. <laughs> I was going to the beach, you know. I was going to the beach in the afternoon. Yeah. I, that 15% would start coming in. George, Gene wants to talk to you. Oh. <laughs> I had to go in the office and say, well, uh, we're going to make some changes. That, uh, we're going to make you vice president Woo. <laughs> of the company. You're doing pretty good. Woo. We're going to put you on salary. Yeah. <laughs> 15% of what? 
we're going to put you on salary and we're going to give you this amount and we're going to give you a salary and then you make a bonus. And uh, so that cut me way down to, uh, that's what they do. Like I said, when I made that $3,500 on the first day at Earl Shine, yeah. that was a local Earl shot. That was a local Earl shot. Then the guy, yeah. they found out nationally, everybody wanted it. All of a sudden wondering, what happened to my Earl Shine deal? They cut me from their coach. They poached you. They poached you. Got you got it going, and then they took it over. They took it away weird. because they weren't gonna let they weren't gonna let uh, uh, this little black boy back at the time make all. The, that was a lot of money coming in back in the day. Yeah. Just think if it, if I made thirty five hundred dollars at one Brooklyn location, just think what happened nationwide. I said, what happened to that account? So that's why I got angry and wanted to leave. And then I made a lot of money at, uh, in advertising. And then I, I did advertising. The comic strip opened in New York City. And I said, let me Great put these club. people on the, on the back of the buses. Put your business in the street. I went to uh, Rich uh, uh, Tinkin and Bob Wax and John McMahon. And I said, you guys need to put this brand new comedy club uh, on every bus going up and down 2nd, 3rd Avenue, New York City. And they said, okay, we think we like that. But well, you come up with the copy, I'll help you make the copy. You drink and laugh at the comic strip with a pie hitting you in the face. Bam. And uh, as I was closing the cell, I would take out my very nice, I would take out my very nice pen always because when you sign a contract, I always wanted to sign with the best pen, um, yeah. Mont, Mont Blanc or something like that we had yeah. back in the day uh, because you want to sign with a real nice pen. And yeah. as I was signing, they were signing the contract. Said, By the way, I do a little comedy act. You know, I've been doing a little comedy on the side, even down next door at Catch Ryan Star. And they said, well, come in tomorrow night and audition, right? And I came back the next night on a Thursday, and I did pretty good. And then I've been on stage every night since then. And, and you so, met you met uh, Jerry Seinfeld there, and he became your best friend. You've been the best man at his wedding. You were the best man at my wedding. Yeah, uh, and, but- and, and, I'm, and I'm the father of all of your kids. So... <laughs> 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 I thought so, they looked funny. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. So, I'll, so Jordan, so, yeah. Well, I have a question. Like, I, I, I'm loving hearing this, and I'm trying to find this common denominator. Like, I, even hearing you talk about towels, I am 100% confident you could go back and start selling towels right now. You oh, do not have a, Well, you have a great, you have a great uh, charismatic personality, but what is it that would you, what makes you successful at everything you do? Is it because you're a hard worker? Is it because you're driven? Like, what is the common denominator? The common, de- the common denominator is teeth. teeth. The, sm- the smile. The smile. You approach somebody, nobody's going to let you smile by yourself. They don't appear. There's, there could be some people that hate you. Like, who? Sometimes I would think, I'm going into this guy asking him for a $200,000, $500,000 program for advertising. There's got to be some guy back in the day. I'm not working with this little They probably said the N-word at the time. But at the same time, I knew it's probably one guy said, well, I'm going to work with this guy. Yeah. So it all balances out. I never had a problem with sales because that's all I do is sell. Whatever you do, you're in the sales business. You yeah. sell your personality before you can sell anything. School teachers, you got to sell a program. They got to buy you. You got you to you have that. And people got to trust you. Just I never lied when I sold. I could stretch the truth, but I never lied. <laughs> hey, you and I talk about comedy all the time and talk about show business all the time. And one of the things that we've said over the years is the number one thing in all of show business is likability. Whether you play music, whether you're a comic, whether you're an actor, if people like you, that's what it is. And that goes back to the smile you were saying. There's a lot to be said to be in a likable person. Don't you think? Whatever you, whatever you guys do, whenever you see anybody approach a mic, approach a lot of people, or, or even the guy on the street uh, performing or selling stuff on the street, they they got to sell their personality first. You see some guys just fantastic at it. Hello, hello. Whatever, were they selling ice cream or whatever? Uh, uh, whatever they uh, umbrellas on the street. One guy makes more money than the other person just because people like the personality. They like to smile how you approach somebody. Even so on the infomercials, they put those people with those huge personalities. Right, look at this pen. Nothing sticks. Can you believe it? And they come out, and there's a guy, there's a better guy every year. That's why they keep coming out with the pans. It's the same old pan, but it's a different guy selling it. Every year they come out with this, this, this non-stick pan has been out for how many years? They just put a different color on it, and it doesn't stick. Nothing <laughs> sticks to this pan. I'm sick and tired of these. New pans. They had a knife one time. They had a Ginsu knife one time. And the knife keeps getting sharper and sharper. And then Ginsu knife, you can't even throw it away. 
I tried to throw mine away and the garbage man knocked on the door and said, Mr. Wallace, <laughs> guaranteed. But yeah, but it's, a, it's, it's always like a bulletin and love what you're doing. When you approach the stage uh, uh, and you go up with a smile and we see it today, we see some great comedians. I mean, really great comedians, but you don't, sometimes you don't see the people say, uh, I like to go have dinner with him. He was really funny, but they don't say I like to go have dinner. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to, to your start because not many people got into show business and within two years got on The Tonight Show as a comic. It already takes five to 10 years to get really good as a comic. <laughs> it takes 15 years to get great. You were on in two years. Johnny loved you and your career took off from, from that moment. Uh, what do you attribute to that? Uh, as his likability once again, likability. And you know, and when I showed up, as Marshall Warfield said on a TV show last night, so when George Wallace showed up, everybody noticed he showed up. He showed up in a brand new Lincoln. And and that's what we liked about him, because nobody had a car with him. If you got a car, <laughs> if you got a car back in the day. And I was thinking out there, does anybody, uh, Ron, you know about this, does anybody pick up anybody and drop anybody off at the airport anymore? Because when we were young, that's all you did was pick up people and drop them off. At the, can you pick me up? Because I dropped you off. What do you want from me? You know, <laughs> George. How many times have I literally dropped you off at the airport? At, and, uh, and at, at least a hundred. Sometimes no I wasn't. Sometimes I wasn't even going to the airport. You just dropped me off. <laughs> 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 but that was fine well, with me because I'd find somewhere to go. Because I've done some stupid things at the airport, and you've been with me. You can tell them about something I did that just can't be done with my personality. You yes. can tell them, what did we well, do one New Year's Day? New Year's, one you day. and I were going over, uh, we had tickets first class to go to Europe. We spent we, 48 I hours did. in the city, go not to the we, next city 48 we, hours. I did. I had them. I was taking my best friend. Yes, because you I were had taking me. Tickets. And we yeah. got to the airport and it was 6, 7 a.m. And you go, I don't wait, wait, wait a here. second, wait, wait a second. Let's go the, the other direction. The first thing we said, we're going to catch the first plane. That was our, our time. We said, we're going to catch the first plane leaving, no matter where it's going. So yeah. when we got there, it was going where, Ron? Uh, she, she, she goes, it's uh, Tokyo. And you go, I don't like Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> and then she goes, well, how about... Um, no, first of uh, all, she said we couldn't use the tickets because the tickets was across the Atlantic Ocean, y'all. Yes, they and were, said, they were in Europe. To, they we're going to go to Paris. I don't want to go to Paris. I want to go across. Yeah. And the lady said, these are only for the Atlantic. I said, I'm going to go to to uh, to, to, to uh, somewhere else. And she said, but you can Far East. Use Far East, what George yeah. did is he he had the cell phone of the CEO of Northwest Airlines. He called him on New Year's morning. It was about 6 a.m. our time. It was about 8 or 9 a.m. his time and woke the guy up and said, <laughs> hey, my ticket said you gave me go to Europe. I want to go the other place. He goes, hand the phone to the lady. <laughs> <laughs> George hands the phone to Best the lady. To Yes, it's the CEO of the whole company. Let them go where they want to go. Yes, sir. <laughs> Wherever they want to go, let them go. And you and I flew to Singapore and Seoul on that trip. No, Bangkok and Hong Kong. We did Bangkok and Hong Kong okay, on like that trip. That. Wow. George, and just to show you, here's another, here's a, sometimes your personality can get so stupid because you're so stern about what your, your thoughts are. We'd go to uh, Bangkok and we'd buy some leather goods and you'd barter. You'd barter over something um, over there for, 25 cents you bought it yes yeah. yes and you get back so fun. what the hell was wrong with me if the thing is worth 80 dollars i'm paying eight dollars for it it sells for 80 dollars in america i'm paying eight. i don't argue over a quarter i'm going oh, yes stupid could i have been? it was so fun though that it's was fun. the most fun of the yeah. bangkok for yeah, me yeah, yeah. hey george we only got a couple minutes left i just want you to promote your book Bull Twit, it is so funny. Tell everybody about Bull Twit real quick. Bull, the book Bull Twit is about my Twitter world. My Twitter world tells everything. Now, I know you can't see it on TV, but this is my, my book, Bull Twit. Why can't you see it on TV? I don't know. I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got is, a green screen behind you, that's why. There you yeah, go, yeah, Bull Twit. Bull Twit. It's about, uh, and Bull Twit and whatnot. It's about my Twitter world things. I just think about growing up. You mentioned about Atlanta, how I grew up so poor. You know, I lie. I just make it up. I said, uh, we were so poor, my dog only had one Ray B. Little things like that and just lie. You know, we, were so, <laughs> we were so poor. We were so poor, we'd watch television. We, uh, But first of all, we were so poor, even on our radio, we never heard of the pips. Only we, we could just listen to Gladys Knight. We never knew there was a pip. <laughs> I, used to, I used to, little online uh, uh, droppings from my brain. Things I You can get that book at uh, georgewallace.net. You can also George call George. 
on Twitter at Mr. At Mr. George Wallace on Twitter. But you got a show on Hulu coming up called The Premise, The Ballad of Jesse Miller. Right now, yeah. the episode, you play the principal on that. On October 5th, Good Morning America. You're going to be in the third hour on Good Morning America, October 5th. That's going to be fun. You got an HBO Max show coming out November 30th. Uh, it's called 10 year old Tom That's where you right. play the lawyer and uh, you can listen to George Thursdays at 6 PM central because our show's on, on later. Thank goodness. But Thank earlier goodness. in the night, you got to listen to George 6 PM central on the Sybil Wilkes live on YouTube and Facebook and Fridays uh, tomorrow. You can hear him on Karen Hunter on Sirius XM 2 PM central. George, you're always working more than the rest of us. I wish you and I had, we've done literally probably a thousand shows together over the years, but it'd be great to do more. Uh, COVID kind of separates our, uh, our, be, our ability be, to get might together. But. With, might be great with you, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard George, he goes, uh-huh. We need to do more shows together. Mm -hmm. hey, Todd, you, Todd, you know, you know what I'm saying. You know. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> He's well, a good we got to wrap it up. So I um, want to thank everybody for listening. Thank you, George Wallace, for being on. And, okay, and get uh, a real hat, okay? Get a real hat that says I'll I know, you're right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, guys. Till next time. Uh, next week, we have Aaron Tate, uh, singer-songwriter turned uh, solo artist, and uh, it'll be an exciting time. So thanks again for listening. Fabulous songwriter. I'm George Tate. Wallace. I love you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. See you. Blessings, thank George. You, thank you. Love it.